Here we are. Let's all sing together, stand together as we worship the Lord. There is a light that burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. It's your love that sets our hearts ablaze. Father, we are on our knees with every heart we bring you this offering. Lord, come and fill this place. There is a king that reigns in victory. There is a mercy strong enough to save.
so where I lay it down, every burden, heavy crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. This is 
is my surrender. Thank you for your prayers. You pulled my team through yesterday. I know you were praying faithfully after I asked you last week, right? No. But Margaret and I were. Uh, There are some serious things going on in our lives, too. Sometimes we think that when we get in the will of God and we begin to live according to his will, the the road is straight and, and smooth and there's never a problem. There's never a struggle. You think that Joseph believe that after he had the dream that he was going to be ruling over his father and ruling over his brothers, that, boy, when this comes true, just the road to get there is going to be a breeze. But then suddenly, life takes a turn for him, and his brothers sell him into slavery, and they throw him into the pit. Sometimes I feel like I've been thrown in the pit. How about you? No? Just me? But when we're in God's will, we learn to understand that God's way is to get us where he wants us to be. Uh, Boy, that song is so easy to sing. It's hard to live, isn't it? I'd like for us this morning to pray together before we get into God's word. And I know some of you have been on the windy road this week. It's been rough. There's been some things uh, happened this week that you didn't expect, some things that are, are, are painful, a struggle in life. We've had some unrest in the Middle East that's going on there again, that ongoing battle over there, over uh, land and territory and all those other things and ideologies and, and then family issues that some of you are going through. And, and saying yes to God's will means that I'm going to trust him even during those hard times, right? So let's pray together. Father, thank you for these stories from your word. They're more than stories. They're real life that teach us to trust you. And that's what we need to do during these un settling times. We pray every week, Father, for the the divided country that we live in that is so opposed and at conflict and war with each other. And then we look across the world, Father, and we see that there are nations at war, and we know this has always been a part of history. Men and women and people are selfish by nature and always wanting power and what Uh, they want and desire rather than your will. But Lord, of all those, you've called us to be people who are people of purpose, called us to be people who not only pray for peace, but live to bring peace wherever we are. Thank you for this kingdom of peace you've called us to. and You've placed the king over our hearts to rule in us. Thank you, Jesus, for that peace that passes understanding. I pray for families that have been through difficulty this week. There's some healing that needs to take place and some, Lord, that looks very hopeless at this time. There's relationships that have been in conflict this week that need a a coming together, a mediation. We pray that your spirit would guide. Lord, we pray for our nation. Seems like every day we wake up to more and more trouble and conflict. We pray for our world that, You've given us the privilege of living upon, and you said we were to be the salt and light of the world, and we pray we would be that, that we would speak truth when others are speaking lies. Lord, that we would desire to serve rather than be served. Call us deeper, we pray. And then today, Lord, help us to just let go of these things that we carry with us into worship this morning. Thank you for songs that challenge us to let you be Lord, let you guide us to surrender to you. And may we do that just starting right now, that your word would teach us and help us to know you better and deeper in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen, amen. Joseph, I hope you've been thinking about Joseph this week and uh, the life that he began to live. we, We talked last week about Joseph being a type of Jesus in the Old Testament, and we see a lot of of what the Lord would ultimately fulfill when he came. And but when Jesus called us to follow him, as he did the first disciples, he called us to abandon everything else as our focus and to make him first. Did you realize that when you signed up for this? If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, that he has to be first. 
And I, you know, figuring that out is one of the most important parts about living in God's will. It sounds simple, but isn't that the ongoing challenge of life is to keep Jesus first and foremost in our lives? Because there are so many other things that compete for our affection and our devotion. And so it's almost like it's every day the disciple has to make a decision. Today, will I make Jesus my primary focus or will Jesus fall in the order of priority? And sometimes I have to admit there, I put other things first rather than him. All of us do. And that's the struggle. But remember that verse that we learned back uh, several weeks ago that said, Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Boy, I almost need to print that out and put it on the mirror every day, don't you? Is anything today worth more than your soul? Is there anything so important that you put Jesus down here on the priority list? He also said to them, if if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. And that's disturbing, isn't it? And then he goes deeper. He says, your father and your mother, your wife and your children, your brothers and your sisters, yes, even your own life. That sounds so foreign that the God of love says that if we're going to be his disciples, we have to hate those people. Otherwise, he says, you cannot be my disciple. But we really know what he's saying, don't we? That we can't move him down in the priority. He has to be at the top of the list. If we're going to love those other people the way we should, he's got to be first in our lives. When did we abandon this requirement for being a disciple? When did it become okay for us to drop following Jesus from being first on our priority list? I think, and, and I'm, I'm trying to connect this this morning with you to the life of Joseph. The story of Joseph is one of those of absolute commitment to living for God. Now, I think it's incredible that Joseph's able to do this without a knowledge of Jesus. He just simply believed God at his word, and he lived in a personal relationship with God without the model of Jesus. Circumstances and difficulty did not sidetrack him from his complete devotion. If any person could have exhibited anger, and bitterness, and vengeance, and hurt, all of these human emotions, it it would have been Joseph, but he never let those emotions that he, you know he had, deter him from living in obedience to God's will. It would be simple to live for God like Joseph did if we didn't have have opposition and temptation, right? But he had it too, and he still lived for God in obedience. Joseph was not immune immune to these struggles. Now, Think about this. When all this begins for Joseph, how old is he? 17. 17 years old. You think, boy, he handles things in a real mature fashion for 17. Do you think? At age 17, his life was forever altered by the treatment he received from his own family, from his own brothers. Don't you know that as the caravan proceeded to Egypt, Joseph had time to think about the situation that he found himself in? Don't you know that he began to try to calculate what his future would hold as a slave in a foreign country? Don't you know that he had probably given up hope that he would ever see his family and his father again? What had become of his future? As, as he traveled with the, in slavery, he began to think, what, what about my potential? I could have been had so much more in my life. What about his dreams? Had he lost all of those things by being treated the way he was and cast into the pit? What we learn from Joseph is that the words of the writer of Proverbs ring true. Commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. Whether you're in the pit or you're in the palace, commit your actions to the Lord and his plans will succeed for you because you'll be living in his plans. I just thought it was interesting as I was going through this story of Joseph, the connection between clothing that we find in the story. Last week, it was the coat of many colors. Remember that? What was that the symbol of? Authority. He was to be a ruler, and and he was a constant visual reminder to his family that someday I'll be in charge, and right now, I'm preferred by daddy over you. So it was 
authority and favor. The coat or the robe became an object of scorn and jealousy for his brothers. And it it also became a a means of deception. Remember, they took the the damaged uh, coat of many colors and they had stained it with the blood of the animal to deceive their father. So today, we look at another cloak that becomes the focus of events in Joseph's life. I'm calling it today the cloak of temptation. Temptation is common to every person, right? And every temptation was there for Jesus as well. So our Savior, our Lord, was tempted in every way as we are. It's interesting what Eugene Peterson says. When an ancient temptation or trial becomes a feature in culture, a way of life that is expected and encouraged, Christians have a stumbling block put before them that is hard to recognize for what it is. For it has been made into a monument gilded with bronze and bathed in decorative lights. So the things that that we were told to resist is what Peterson's saying, have now been elevated by our culture to be something to be glorified and esteemed. And so the Christian has to constantly be on the lookout for what are those things that could trap us as Potiphar's wife tried to trap Joseph. Let's go to Genesis chapter 39 this morning. First 23 verses. Pick up the story. He's now been sold into slavery. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. It's important to know that he had no choice in the matter. He did not fill out an application for a job. He was sold by the traders to Potiphar. Potiphar, it's very important to know who he is. He is like the the security for Pharaoh. He is part of his army. He's the secret service for Pharaoh. A captain of the guard, the king of Egypt. But listen to this phrase. The Lord was with Joseph. Now that you're thinking, how could the Lord be with Joseph if he's now been sold into slavery? How could that be a sign of God's will for his life? God had a plan, didn't he? So because the Lord was with Joseph, he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph. Who is Potiphar? Potiphar is a man who lives in a godless society. They had many gods in Egypt. The sun was their god. The river was their god. They worshiped the creation around them rather than the creator. But here's a guy who notices something significant about Joseph that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar. So he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. And from the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All of his household affairs ran smoothly. His crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. When Joseph, with Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Boy, I want to hire a guy like that, don't you? What an incredible addition he was to his household. Here comes the trap. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? And then he says, note this in your Bible. It would be a great sin against God. The Lord was with Joseph. He thought about other people in his relationship with them, but he thought about first his relationship with God. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her and he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around and he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. When she saw that she was holding his cloak and he had fled, she called out to her servants, 
Soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. She kept the cloak. Boy, they say cloak a lot there, don't they? I think the Bible wanted us to know something about the cloak with her until her husband came home. Then she told him her story. The Hebrew slave you brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak with me. Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph in the pit because he was with the Lord. The Lord was with Joseph in Potiphar's house, even though this terrible offense comes into his life, the sin against him. And then, of course, the Bible says, and the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Over and over and over again, what's the common thread in Joseph's life? The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph because Joseph was living in God's will. And so from the pit where he could have had a pity party, we find him being sold into slavery into Potiphar's house. Joseph's journey, beginning at age 17, formative years for the future of this young man. He will face in this time at 17 many struggles and trials. And his first move is from the pit that his brothers threw him into, into the home of Potiphar, an influential man connected tightly to the Pharaoh of the day. Coincidence? Lucky break? We know the story, and we know that God is in control. Even when you and I feel like victims of circumstance, that we are walking in God's will, and he orders our steps. And even though we're going through difficult times, we are still in the will of God, and God will turn those things and shape those things for our good. Joseph's perspective is that if I have to deal with this, if I have to be a slave, after being sold by my brothers, I'm still going to commit to living in God's will. And as a slave, I'm going to be the best slave you've ever seen. Potiphar's house, get this, was not a detour in God's plan for Joseph's future. It was part of God's plan. That was an amen moment right there too. You missed it. He could have surrendered to self-pity And in doing so, he could have remained mentally and spiritually in that hole that his brothers had thrown him into. He could have lived the rest of his life from 17 on in a pit of despair, in a pit of self-pity, in a a pit of lost opportunity. The alternative, uh, we see no way out of that pit sometimes, but the alternative was to be sold. So he got out of the pit by being sold. That sounds better, doesn't it? I don't know. Now he becomes the possession of another person. He becomes a slave. Joseph surrenders his own will. He has no will at this point. He he has no choice. But let me tell you something. Before he belonged to Potiphar, he already belonged to someone. He belonged to God first. And before anyone could buy or sell him, he had put himself in the hands of God. You, if you are a Jesus follower, let me tell you, you were bought with a price. Jesus paid for you. The enemy has no right over you. He might orchestrate things to try to test your resolve and and, and try to pull you back, but you belong to God first. We wear on ourselves the cloak of forgiveness. You and I, when we became to know Jesus, put on the royal robes of a king. We are children of God. And we need to look at ourselves that way. The slave traders may have literally pulled him out of the pit, but I'm going to tell you, it was the hand of God that was caring for him. It was the hand of God that was providing for him. It was the hand of God that brought him into Potiphar's house. He was living in the certainty of the heavenly dream that he had received. They had taken his freedom, but they had not taken his vision by what they did to him. 
They had taken control of his life, but he trusted that God was still in control. God was able to turn the tables on the enemy to complete the work that he was doing in and through Joseph. Listen, God was not done with Joseph at 17. God had a work that he was doing inside of him, and it took going from the pit to the Potiphar's house to the palace or to the prison then to the palace to get it done. Listen, what's the message there? Don't lose your faith when the trial comes. Don't lose your focus. Don't surrender to the circumstance that you find yourself in. Have you decided to commit to God's will over your own comfort and happiness? And the key phrase that we find in this whole story is this one, the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did. How does God measure success? Joseph's title was still slave and servant, right? To the rest of the world, what was Joseph? He was a slave. But in Potiphar's house, the Bible says that he rose to a place of responsibility and authority. Why? Because the Lord was with him. He succeeded in everything he did. Do you realize that God wants to see on what God wants to see on your resume is that you are a servant of all? The best leaders understand this. The faithful followers of Jesus read the book when it said that blessed are you, when Jesus said, blessed are you when you become a person who washes other people's feet. Did you read that part? That's when you're blessed. Why was Potiphar impressed with Joseph? Why did he put Joseph in charge as his personal assistant? He could have moped around, Joseph could have moped around the house. I hate this. I had a nice coat. I had a nice life. Now I'm living in this house as a slave. He could have hated his circumstances. He could have hated his job. Anybody ever see you moping around like that at work? I hate my job. I told our staff last Sunday, I said, there is joy in the work of the kingdom. And I, and, and we have joy in what we do, serving God. Uh, dream, he could have been saying, I'm dreaming of a better situation. Instead, Joseph no matter what the circumstance, no matter where he was, served faithfully where God had placed him. The Lord was with him because he was living faithfully where God had placed him. God had put him in Potiphar's house. And he says, I'm going to be the best servant Potiphar's ever had. And he was. Amen? Yes. Jesus talked about that. A lot of us aspire for great things, to be successful. Jesus said, if you are faithful in little things, then you'll be faithful in larger ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with your responsibilities. Jesus says you prove your worth by being faithful in the little things. God was at work raising up a leader in Potiphar's house. This was part of God's training for him. Even uh, Potiphar saw that the Lord was the source of giving him success in everything he did. Listen, Potiphar was part of a pagan religious system. And even his name was a tribute to the sun god. Potiphar was uh, meant devoted to the sun. So he had no connection to the god of Joseph. But he was smart enough to know that whoever uh, Joseph is serving is blessing him. The world sees Jesus when his servants are living their lives faithfully. How would Potiphar view your work ethic? Oh, now you're going to get personal. When no one else is watching, he's watching. And they're working as unto him. The Bible teaches us that. That whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father to him. How would Potiphar view your work ethic? Would it be obvious that the Lord is with you by the way you do what you do in the circumstance you find yourself in right now? And the temptation then comes along for him to have some gratification in his life. Would he be self-gratifying or would he be faithful? The test comes to Joseph in a very human and natural way. I want you to know something. If you read the scripture carefully, we are not the only sex-obsessed society that has ever existed. It's always been that way. Historians tell us that Egypt was a nation of very low moral expectations. Some historians even said that it was not out of bounds for Potiphar's wife to pursue relationships with other men besides her husband. That was just part of their society. Sound familiar? 
There were no sexual taboos among their culture and society. But the struggle here for Joseph begins where it begins with all of us in the mind. Peterson said, the ancient temptation has been made into a monument gilded with bronze and bathed in decorative light. Listen, this, no, this is nothing new, that we have changed our identities from being made in God's image to being purely sexual beings. Our society has elevated our sexual identity beyond our primary identity. It's who God created you, not what your sexual compulsion is that identifies who you are. Forget the biblical standards is what the society said in, in Joseph's day for sexual behavior. Forget the things that the Bible forbids. We have a new idol, and it is the same idol that Adam and Eve struggled with. We want to be our own God. And that was the temptation of the enemy. You decide who you are. You decide who you want to be. You dictate the authority in your own life. We want to justify our sinful behavior by putting our feelings and our fulfillment first in our lives instead of serving and pleasing God as first in our life. And listen, this, let's, what, how old is this young man we're dealing with? 17. The scripture says Joseph was good looking, handsome, and well built. Very descriptive, isn't it? I never was accused of being any of those things. 17. Good looking, handsome, well built. And don't you know that he had been told that? And, and the thoughts of being selfish after all that he had suffered must have been there. He, he probably was thinking, you know what? After what I've been through and what I've endured, I, I deserve some pleasure in my life. I deserve some self-gratification. I've been, you know, sold into slavery. I've been serving this, this man, Potiphar. You know, here it is. It's available. And she was there for the taking. And probably the enemy was saying, no one will ever know. And our society would say, you know what? He was simply expressing his inborn sexuality. I deserve this. The pain of my brother's betrayal could be easily dampened by the pleasure of the moment. You know what? I think the lesson we learn is if, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have to constantly remind yourself of who and whose you are. Who are you? You are more than your sexuality. You are created in the image of God. You have been bought with a price. You have surrendered your will to God's will. There is a tempter there influencing you to deceive you into believing that it, it won't hurt anyone. You won't have to pay a price. That you'll feel so much better if you just give in and act on your urges and your feelings. If the battle begins in the mind, what was Joseph thinking? The Bible says Joseph was thinking of God and also of Potiphar. Two statements here reveal the heart of Joseph in this story. He said, I'm not going to do this. The master trusts me with everything in his household. His status and his love and respect for the one who had authority over him. It, it, he had learned before we even heard Jesus say it, to love his neighbor as himself. It might not have been wrong in Egyptian society, but it was wrong in Joseph's relationship with his creator and his God. The morals of Egypt did not trump the truth of God's word that Joseph had hid in his heart. Second, he said it would be a great sin against God. But wait, didn't God allow him to be hurt by his brothers? Didn't God allow him to be sold into slavery? Didn't God allow him to be put in this situation, in this position? But Joseph loved God more than he wanted to express himself sexually. Joseph moved from the pit to Potiphar's house, and then through this injustice from Potiphar's house, he moves to the prison. Listen, I want to tell you, Satan will always show us shortcuts to following through on God's will for our lives. He will always question God's authority in our lives. He will always tempt us to take that shortcut to happiness instead of remaining on the narrow road that leads to
to faithfulness. Why does the Bible say in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. If we are not actually running towards sin, we have a tendency to at least linger in its presence. But we are commanded to do the only safe thing, run away from the lust of the flesh and run as fast as you can. What happens when we pay a price for doing the right thing, for resisting sin and paying a price for it? Well, that's the moment where we have to trust God's will and we have to trust God's plan. You say, well, what if it's going to cost me? And it cost him. We, we don't see him defending himself here. We don't see him hiring an attorney to sue for sexual harassment, do we? I, I, I even dug in there because I wanted to say, did he at least say what really happened? But there she stood holding what? The cloak. And the circumstantial evidence had already convicted him in Potiphar's mind. It's interesting to me that once again, a garment, an article of clothing becomes a key part of the story. He tore himself away from the temptation, but he left his cloak in her hand. The Bible is very specific in saying she saw his cloak, hold, she, saw, she was still holding it, and then that's when she takes the, the cloak and says, he tried to rape me, but I screamed. He ran outside but he got, and he got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. I want you to know that that cloak was important. Oh, it's no big deal. It's just part of the story. The cloak became evidence that led to God's will. Didn't it? Without the cloak, she has no evidence. Without the cloak, he doesn't get convicted and thrown into prison. There are moments in time where God uses something that did not feel good in our lives, that we did not enjoy, that seemed unfair and unjust, to accomplish his will. And there are times that we need to let go of the cloak. Let it go. She effectively uses it to, as a evidence of a crime that Joseph didn't commit. Again, an opportunity for Joseph to become bitter, but he doesn't. He could have been bitter towards this lying, scheming woman, but he doesn't. I sound bitter toward her, don't I? Called her lying and scheming. She is. He could have dwelt on the fact that this cloak got him thrown into prison, but he doesn't. Once again, we find Joseph settling into a place where his life had led him. It's not that he's thrilled to be there, but while he's there, he's willing to do his best with the cards that life has dealt him. The Bible says that not only was the Lord with him in Potiphar's house, the Lord was with Joseph in that prison and that God not only was with him there, but he showed him his faithful love. How did he show him his faithful love? He experienced the presence and the love of God even in the worst of places. Where is God when we are moving from the pit along the journey to the prison? I believe that Joseph traded the cloak of temptation for a robe of righteousness at that very moment. He said, I choose to throw off the temptation so that I can wear the robe of righteousness. This gets personal with us, doesn't it? Because our struggles are personal. Our temptations are personal. What is your struggle? What is your greatest temptation? I don't know about you, but I find myself at times envying the people that don't struggle with the things I struggle with. And we also we think that, boy, they've got their life all together, but they have their own struggle too. We don't know about because they're good at hiding it. And we're really good at hiding it too. But if we look closely, they have their own to deal with. And, and Jesus says, it's not that we, we don't have those struggles. We do. They're real in our lives. But he says, we must deny ourselves. Self-denial is the first step to getting a robe of righteousness. Resisting the temptation. And what came through in Joseph's life here is that word that we all want to aspire to, faithfulness. And understand that even the prison was part of God's plan. Spoiler alert, again, we're moving toward the end of the story here in the next few weeks. Without the prison, 
Joseph doesn't get to the palace to serve with Pharaoh. True? He could not have gone from the pit right to the palace. He could not have gone from the pit and and skipped over Potiphar's house and gone right to the prison. All of it was part of God's sequence, God's plan, God's procedure. What was going on in this young man's life while he was walking through these struggles and these temptations? God was developing a leader. He already had the diamond in the rough. And as he was going through these issues and standing strong for God, God was chipping away at the imperfections. God was developing the man that would stand at the right hand of Pharaoh someday and rule the nation. But it wouldn't happen because these are stepping stones to God fulfilling his dream and vision in in Joseph's life. The thing is that we can't see those at the time, can we? But that's where the promise comes into play, isn't it? that God will bring to completion what he has begun in us. In due time, he will lift us up. That's what Peter says. Peter knew what it was like to go through the process of leadership development, didn't he? So humble yourselves, he says, under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. It wasn't time for Joseph yet. His time was coming. But at the right time, God was going to lift him up. Peter knows you have to be broken sometimes to find your purpose. That's why he writes those words. He felt the thrill of blessing. Remember, we talked about that, the real person of Peter. But he felt the humility of rebuke from Jesus. He stood powerfully as the, the first preacher of the gospel on the day of Pentecost because he had felt the pain of betraying the Lord. He learned to trust that he was loved no matter what by his failures. And Peter became Peter the apostle because he, became, he was Peter the failure. Peter, the, the broken at times in his life. Have, I, have you been that? The broken? The failure? But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed his faithful love. And, I, and the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. He cannot get out of being the favorite, can he? His brothers couldn't stand him because he was daddy's favorite. Now the prisoners can't stand him because he's the warden's favorite. What's God doing? He's building something in him. He could have been honored by Potiphar. He, He could have traded this honor of God being with him, of being gratified by Potiphar's wife. He could have enjoyed the success of running his house, of Potiphar's house, but God did not have that purpose for him. He had a higher purpose for Joseph beyond Potiphar's house. And he does for you as well. Along the way, we may have to abandon the cloak of temptation to reach our purpose. What worldly idol do you need to surrender? and leave behind in the hands of the enemy so that you can move forward in God's will for you. You say, well, pastor, I'm not called to the ministry full time, but you are being raised up as a priest, as unto the Lord, as a child of God. You belong to him. You are a royal priest, and he desires for your life to make a significant difference in the world you live in. Sometimes it takes going from a pit Potiphar's house to the prison to get there. Stand with me, would you? This is a sermon that asks for surrender today. I always hated these when my pastor would preach them. I was one of those guys that would hang on to the back of the pew. We had pews. And I'm sure that my teenage handprints were on the back of the pews from hanging on on some Sundays when I could feel God calling me. I could feel God dealing with me and saying, Tommy, just Surrender. Be broken. There have been times in my ministry life that things that were not pleasant produced something in me, brokenness in me, that led me to tears and humility and saying, God, I want your honor and favor more than I want the favor of people. That's what he desires for all of us. As you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning before we say, Would you listen to the heart of God? I want you to know that he loves you as he loved Joseph. That he sees your heart. He sees your effort. And there are moments in time that he he wants you to just let go. To be weak in yourself, but to be strong in him. To, To be broken of your own passion and will. To be broken.
broken of your own ambition and to just be who he created you to be. Stop believing those lies of our culture, of society, that we are only identified by our sexuality or anything else, by our gender. Scripture is very clear that in the body of Christ there is no male or female or any of those things that we are all seeing through the loving eyes of God as his creation. Thank him that he made us male and female, but he made us all in his image to be that person that he's called and created us to be. Would you surrender today? Would you be broken of your own will? There were those divine moments in my life where I let go of that seat and I walked forward in my church. It was There's nothing magical about a, a bench in the front or, or an altar, but boy, that walk was a moment of surrender for me. If you need to do that today, we have altars. We have a prayer room with someone staffing and they'll pray with you. But right where you are, you can say tomorrow, I'm going to, or today, when I leave here, I'm going to begin a new life of surrender to Him. Let's sing together.
with us, Father, as we go to serve you. Post those guards around us. Open our eyes to the struggles around us. Help us, Lord, to remember our calling as your servants. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.